Daniel chapter number two. We've got about four verses to finish in the second chapter of Daniel. And uh, we'll continue moving through this book on Wednesday nights. We're going to be in the book of Philippians. And then after that, I've been praying about it for a little while now. I think I'm going to go ahead and do a series on, uh, on the, the King James Bible. I believe I'm going to do that not too long from now as well. So if you have your Bible, Daniel chapter 2. And once you get Daniel 2, I'd like you also to take and get a mark and put it in Proverbs 16. Proverbs 16. Um, you know, the background of, of chapter 2 where we've been in now for several weeks is this, that you got the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, who dreamed dreams. And in verse 1 of chapter 2, the Bible says his spirit was troubled. He was a troubled king. He wasn't troubled because he had a problem with the economy. That wasn't the problem. He wasn't troubled because he had an army that was outside the gates of Babylon and uh, was bearing down upon uh, his people. That wasn't the problem. As far as we know, he didn't have a problem with anything is, with his health. Nothing is mentioned to indicate that. But what he had a problem with was a dream that he had. And it troubled his spirit to the point that he couldn't sleep anymore. That's what verse 1 says of chapter 2. Well, we've come all the way down through chapter 2, and we have seen Daniel step in and have a prayer meeting with his friends, and we've seen God give an answer to Daniel. Then we've seen Daniel to go in to the king and give the king the dream and tell him not only the dream but the interpretation thereof. And tonight we pick up in verse 46. Look what the Bible says. Then the king, Nebuchadnezzar, fell upon his face and worshiped Daniel and commanded that they should offer an oblation and sweet odors unto him. The king answered unto Daniel and said, Of a truth it is that your God is a king of God, a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets, seeing thou couldst reveal this secret. Then the king made Daniel a great man and gave him many great gifts, and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon, and chief of governors over all the wise men of Babylon. Then Daniel requested of the king, and he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king. Now what we see is, God's at work in Nebuchadnezzar's life. God sends him the dream. Nebuchadnezzar's wise men and magicians and astrologers cannot give an answer, but there is a God in heaven who can give an answer. And Daniel steps forward, and he gives not only the dream, but the interpretation. And when that happens, verse 46 starts with the word then. Do you see that in your Bible? So after he is told not only about the dream and the interpretation, but also about these kingdoms and then how that that stone that crushes those feet and that whole image passes away and now becomes a great mountain. The Bible says, then King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face. And what I'm going to do tonight, if I can, I know the title in my Bible, as far as the section in the study Bible, says the promotion of Daniel. And I, I'm not against that terminology or that phrase, but I, I think there's something a whole lot larger here and of greater importance than the promotion of Daniel. I think the turning of the heart of a king is what we see in verses 46 through 49. And I think that that is in contrast to verse number one because we have a king with a troubled heart. So we have a king that has a troubled heart and now that heart, that heart is being turned by God. Look if you would in Proverbs 16, and again, I have quoted this. You've probably quoted it. You've heard it quoted while someone's preaching. And tonight we have an example of it in the Bible in real life. In verse number one, Proverbs 16, the preparation of the heart of man and the answer of the tongue is of the Lord. Boy, that is not the verse that I wanted. I think it's Proverbs 20, verse number one. No, that is not the verse I wanted. It's 21, verse 21. The heart, or the king's heart, is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. Now, I want you to look at that again. The king's heart 
that means Nebuchadnezzar. The king's heart, that means President Trump. The king's heart, all right, that means whomever you put on any throne, any, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. Very difficult to turn a river. You're going to have to have a lot of equipment and engineering and labor to turn a river, but not with God. God can turn a river whether he wants to turn it. And not only that, the Bible says he can turn the heart of the king. And that's what we have in Daniel chapter 2. Now you say, well, why is that important? Here's why that's important. Because I know that there are people that you love that perhaps some of you have given up hope on. That you have a son that's been out in the world now for some number of years or you have a, you have a dear friend, maybe a mother, that you have witnessed too many times and we're coming up on Thanksgiving and Christmas. Maybe you've got a friend that you were childhood friends for so long and now that's been broken and because of things in life it's just been separated and it's just kind of, you know, I've asked God, I've talked to God and it just seems there is no hope or any help. And what I want you to see tonight is if God can turn the heart of the ruler of the world in Nebuchadnezzar, he can turn the heart of those that you hold up before him as well. Now that doesn't mean that God will choose salvation for anyone. We don't believe that. We believe that God is not willing that any should perish. But we also believe that God gave men and man the choice of salvation. So we can ask God, God, would you save them? You say, I, I just don't see any, I don't see any progress forward. And, and I wish that God would do something to change their heart. Well, tonight, take courage in what you see in the heart of a king. Now, mind you, look in verse 46 again. Then the king. We are, we are not talking about, uh, you know, somebody that is of no reputation. We're not talking about a common man. We're not talking about somebody that has no power or has no status. We're talking about the king, Nebuchadnezzar. We're talking about a man that others had to bow down in front of, that others did his bidding, that had conquered many other nations around him. This is a mighty man. This is a man of, of, of preeminence, of, a, a man of stature in the world. And look what God says about this man. Verse 46, then the king Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face. The first thing you see about this king is his humiliation of his own self. Nebuchadnezzar humiliates himself or he humbles himself, if you would, and he falls upon his face. Now, that is the king of Babylon. I'm not talking about a preacher. I'm not talking about a missionary. I'm talking about the king of Babylon. The Bible says that he fell upon his face, prostrate, if you would, that he takes and he lays himself out flat. That is a, a position of self-humiliation. That's exactly what he does. And I don't know the picture in your mind to see this man to get off a throne. Here stands Daniel, a captive in front of him. All the court is around him. All these men of power and might and generals and wise men and, and all these other people are there. And Daniel stands in front of this king and he gives him his dream and the interpretation. And when he finishes, when he finishes, the Bible says this king... Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face. You know the truth of the matter? In the Bible, the way up is always down. The Bible says that a man that exalted himself, that he'll be humbled, but a man that humbleth himself, that God will exalt him. And this is a king that is exalting, not rather himself, but he is humbling himself. He's falling upon his face. He didn't say he got on his knees. Understand, listen guys, he got on his face. He's laid out flat on his face. He's as close to the dirt as you can get. A man that probably had the finest, the finest clothes that the world had to offer puts himself right down in the dirt. And he does that because of what God is doing in his heart. Now, I looked in the Bible. There are many people that fall upon their face and have this recognition of humility. You can see Daniel in chapter 8. If you want to turn there in Daniel chapter 8, he falls on his face, the Bible says. 
Um, Daniel chapter 8, if you'd look there in verse number 17, the Bible says, So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and fell upon my face. See, he falls on his face in front of Gabriel. I looked it up, and Moses falls on his face. He and Aaron, they fall on their face before God. Joshua falls on his face. The people of God, when the fire fell from heaven, when Elijah had taken and prayed and God sent the answer, the Bible says they fell on their face. You can chase that through other parts of the Bible. Abraham falls on his face. David, David in 1 Chronicles chapter 21, when he had made an error in numbering the people, when he and his entourage get to Ornan's threshing floor and he looks up and he sees that angel with that drawn sword in his hand, you know, the Bible says that he fell on his face. That's a king. That, that is a king that has other people waiting on him and serving him, and yet he falls on his face. Jesus did the same thing in Matthew chapter 26. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus takes and he goes a little farther after he leaves Peter, James, and John, and he falls upon his face. You're talking about the king of kings. And he takes and he humbles himself. But I'm going to tell you what I think. I think there's a little bit too much pride in our country. I think there's a little bit too much worship of self. I think it'd do us all good if we'd recognize exactly who we are and who God is and understand that we need to take a position of humility and not exaltation. Amen. Amen. And if a king can humble himself, if a lost king can humble himself, listen, I, I'm pre listen, listen to me. I'm preaching right now to young people that won't let anybody tell them what to do. I'm preaching to some people that won't allow a preacher to preach something in the Bible because as soon as they mention that subject, I'm turning it off and I'm not listening and I'm closing my Bible because nobody is going to preach to me on that particular subject. That's the wrong attitude to have. Listen, if a pagan king can humble himself, you and I ought to humble ourselves as well. But I'm going to tell you what great hope there is that a pagan king would have his heart so touched by God that he goes from trouble to humiliation and humbling himself. You know, some of the family members that you have that you love, you know, the only hope for them is they'd humble themselves. You know, that prodigal son never returned home until he came to himself down that hog pen. Never, never moved one step back toward daddy and back toward the house until he humbled himself. And this, this king, he humbles himself. Now look what he does when he humbles himself. The Bible says there in Daniel chapter 2, it says in verse 46 that he fell upon his face, and then the Bible says that he worshiped Daniel. Now, that's a mistake. Um, in fact, that's probably a little bit more than a mistake. That's, that's a sin. You know, you're not supposed to worship men. The Bible says that he worshiped Daniel. And if you look, it says he commanded that they should offer an oblation and sweet odors unto him. An oblation is a gift. A sacrifice is usually when something is either um, slain or burned or destroyed, but an oblation is something that's just a gift. And he says, I want you to give this man gifts and I want you to bring sweet odors unto him. Now, a lot of people say, well, that means they burn incense to him. You know, I looked in the Bible, Philippians chapter 4, the gifts from Epaphroditus to Paul are called a sweet-smelling savor. Esther, the things for purification were called also a, a sweet odor and savor. And all I'm just saying is I'm not certain about that, but here's what I am certain of. I'm certain that once this king's heart is turned and he humbles himself, the next thing he does is he worships. He just points his worship the wrong direction. And it says that he, now look at it now. It says in verse 46 that he worshiped Daniel, but he commanded that they should offer an oblation and sweet odors unto him. In other words, he's going to have everybody join into this. He's going to have all the men. Now, I want you to think about this. He's going to have his generals. He's going to have his secretary of state. He's going to have all these prestigious people that are there. And he says, I'm going to tell you what we're going to do. All right, he's on his face, and he's worshiping a man. He said, I'll tell you what we're going to do. You guys, you go, you go get some oblations, and you go and you get some sweet odors, and we're going to, take, we're going to worship this man right here. Now, that's the wrong thing to do. That's the wrong thing to do. But what he's doing, he's doing something that out of his heart 
He's had an answer given to him. He's had someone do something for him that all of his magicians and all of his uh, Chaldeans and wise men could not do, and he wants now to somehow return something, and he has no idea which way to turn. But I think by the end of the book, I think he's going to know which way to turn. I would say this to all of us this evening. Listen, the Bible's very clear in Matthew chapter 4 and verse number 10. You know what Jesus says to the devil when the devil tries to get him to worship him? He says, you're supposed to worship God. God's the only person you're supposed to worship. I don't know why Daniel took this worship. It would seem like he would have stopped Nebuchadnezzar. In fact, perhaps if he had stopped Nebuchadnezzar here, maybe we wouldn't have the same thing going on in chapter 3. Then again, maybe we would have. But he allows Daniel, or Daniel allows him to worship him. And that's the wrong thing. In fact, you have that happen in the book of Acts and Revelation a couple of times. If you'll turn there just a moment, Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10, and look, look at how that takes place. A man worshiping another man, all right? Acts chapter 10. In Acts 10, we'll turn to a couple of these. In Acts chapter 10, you have a man by the name of Cornelius. And Cornelius is certainly someone that... Uh, uh, is searching for God. He's looking for the truth. And the Bible says in verse 25, and as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him. Now he's an Italian. He is a man that prays to God, gives alms, but he doesn't know who God is. Verse 25, and as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshiped him. You see that in your Bible? But Peter took him up saying, stand up. I myself also am a man. Peter said, no, 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 wait a minute, Cornelius. No, you don't need to worship me. No, I'm a man just like you are. You shouldn't give me adoration like that. I am not worthy. I'm not worthy of that. It happens again in chapter 14 if you look there. Paul, chapter 14, if you look there in verse number 11, after this man is healed, the Bible says in verse 11, and when the people saw what Paul had done, they lift up their voices saying in the speech of Lyconia, the gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. And they called Barnabas Jupiter. All right, that's the king of the Roman gods. And Paul Mercurius, because he was the chief speaker. Then the priest of Jupiter, which was before their city, brought oxen and garlands under the gates. That's the same thing as bringing oblations. And would have done sacrifices with the people, which when the apostles Barnabas and Saul heard of it, they rent their clothes, ran in among the people, crying out and saying, Sirs, why do you these things? We also are men of like passions with you and preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities unto the living God. They said, stop. Paul and Barnabas run in the middle and they rip their clothes. They say, whoa, whoa stop what you're doing. You, you should not be worshiping Barnabas and I. This is wrong. You're supposed to worship God. That's the only person you're supposed to worship. Look at it again in Revelation chapter 19. Again, we're, we're talking about men worshiping other men. Revelation chapter 19. And again, these people are worshiping Paul and Barnabas because they saw a miracle. Cornelius is worshiping Peter because it's an answer to his prayer and he's been hungry in his heart for the truth. And so he's worshiping a man. Revelation chapter 19. In Revelation 19, speaking of the apostle John, a, a man certainly that we would consider to be a godly man, a good man, uh, a man that was beloved of Jesus Christ, the disciple whom Jesus loved. And in Revelation chapter 19, look down if you would at verse number 9. And he said unto me, Blessed are they which are called in the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. Do you see that in your Bible? And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. Amen. He says, John, you don't need to worship me. You need to worship God. And I'm certain it's because he sees this great picture, the marriage supper of the Lamb and those four hallelujahs that are there in chapter 19 and the heavens about to open and boy, Jesus is about to ride out on this white horse. But he, he begins worshiping a fellow servant. Now he says he stops him. Look at it one more time, Revelation 22. Revelation 22 and verse number 8. You think about all that John has seen. He's seen a new heaven. He's seen a new earth. He has seen so much. 
In verse number eight, and I, John, saw these things and heard them, and when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. You see that in your Bible? Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book. The next two words, can you say them for me? Worship God. Come on, now can you, let's try it one more time. The next two words, the Bible says to do what? Worship God. Now we know that. And Nebuchadnezzar does not know that, but we know that in what I'm pointing out to you. This is John. The Apostle John, one of the three men that were closest to Jesus, and twice he's fallen down in front of a fellow servant. We see Cornelius fall down in front of Peter. We see these people fall down in front of, of, of Paul and Barnabas, and they're all saying the same thing. You need to get up. We're men just like you are. You need to worship God instead. Now, when I, when I think about that, go back if you would to Daniel chapter 2. I am not certain why Daniel didn't do the same thing. Um, perhaps it was because of fear. Could be. You got to remember the room he's in is filled with all kind of men of power and prestige. And maybe when this king falls down in front of him and he's just taken aback, not what he expected. And look, he's a Hebrew. He's a Jew. He knows that we're not supposed to worship other gods. In fact, those Hebrew boys are going to be thrown in that furnace because they will not worship another image. He knows that's wrong. But maybe because of the fear in his heart, he doesn't say what he should say. Or it may be this. I think there's sometimes that people, they take and they allow people to do things for them because they seek their favor. I don't think that's true of Daniel, but I think it's true of others. They'll take and they'll brag on people and they'll, they'll lift up people and they'll promote people because they want favor with them. And then, and then the idea, the last little word that I'd put in there is maybe because of a fantasy. And I don't believe that this is Daniel's problem, but I think there are people that worship other people because they fantasize in being in that place. So buckle your seatbelt for just a minute. There are people that worship men today. And what I mean by that is this. There are people today that worship celebrities. They worship the people that walk down those red carpets. They take all those pictures. They have them to sign autographs and all these things. Would you sign my scarf? Would you sign this? They worship celebrities and they fantasize, I think, about being like them. That's why they worship them. And not just celebrities, but also athletes. Well, they want to be like the athletes. I want to be like Mike. That was in my day. And when I say Mike, that's Michael Jordan. That's a long time ago. Everybody wanted to be like Mike and play with your tongue out of your mouth and have Nike airs on your feet. And I never shaved my head, but I sure was glad when they went to the long shorts instead of the short shorts that we used to wear before them. And man, he brought that in. I want to be like Mike. And boy, they revere these athletes. And look, they, they have all kinds of things that happen. They interview them. They put them in front of cameras and people worship them and Oh, such a great player, the greatest of all time, the goat. I don't know that I'd want to be called the goat, but that's exactly what happens. And men worship athletes and they worship celebrities, and I think they do it because of the fantasy of it. I, I'm going to be like them. If I could have me some Nike Airs, if I, could, drop, if I could just have some Nike Airs, I could go ahead and get up there at 10 feet and I could rock the cradle and I could go ahead and put it down. You know what? You can put on 20 pairs of Nike Airs, and if you're 5 foot 11, chances are you're never going to dunk anything but up. Tennis ball. Yeah. You can dream all you want to about it. You can get the number that they wear. You can get their jersey. You can go out on the court and play that way. You can say, I'm going to fashion. Listen, all I'm saying is that they worship men and celebrities. And I'm telling you right now, we ought not to, you should never encourage your children to worship celebrities and athletes or musicians. I don't know that I've ever heard a song that Justin Bieber has ever sung in my life. I think I'm glad of that. Um, and I'm not saying, I heard that he's made a profession of, of faith in Christ. I hope that's true. But, but I, I do remember a generation that swooned over Elvis Presley, and boy, if they just got a little sweat on, they'd walk around with that, that, that uh, scar for, you know, for 50 years and say, boy, he, he, he sweat, he wiped his face with this right here. And all. Listen, to have some musician that you idolize, that you, in, that you, in, you adore, You've got a king that's worshiping a man, and we say, well, that's a horrible thing, but we've got children, young people, young adults that worship musicians because of their ability. 
Boy, so many people worship people in the 60s and that had the ability to play guitars and all these things and make music. And all I'm saying is that that goes on today. Sometimes we have people that worship people of power. Steve Jobs, he's gone. Bill Gates, don't see him too much. Mark Zuckerberg. I heard that Mark Zuckerberg, I don't know if this is true, I've heard that Mark Zuckerberg cuts his hair like pictures that you see of the Caesars in Rome. Now, if that man thinks he's equivalent to a Caesar in Rome, he's lost his mind. But to think that you would do that, well, but there are people who say, yes, sir, you can sit here. Oh, what can I do for you? Because they want their favor. We worship people of power. Sometimes we worship people that we shouldn't worship. Sometimes I think we worship preachers. Sometimes I think that, that men have the idea that, that that man needs to be worshipped. You know, a preacher, a preacher of the gospel and a preacher of the Bible should always take whatever accolades are given to him and point them to where he got the, the energy and the enabling to preach the gospel and preach that Bible. He should always point it back to God. If you've got an ability to play an instrument, you ought to always point the glory back to God. If you've made all kind of money, you ought to point back to God. It ought not to be about you. It ought to be about him. And what I'm saying is that th this man is worshiping other men. And we say, well, that's terrible. But we shouldn't have any part of that either. Amen. In fact, we don't have to say tonight, hey, church, you're listening. We ought to worship God. <laughs> Amen. We ought to worship God. If a pagan king can humble himself, and then he can turn and worship a man. You and I ought to be able to humble ourselves and worship the King of kings and Lord of lords. It ought not to be a hard, difficult thing for us. So if you go back to Daniel chapter 2, you see here the, the king as he humbles himself, the king's humiliation. But then not only that, the Bible says in verse 47, the king answered Daniel and said of a truth, it is that your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets, seeing thou couldst reveal this secret. That's the exaltation of God. Nebuchadnezzar humbles himself. The humiliation of himself at verse 47 is the exaltation of God. Now, he, he doesn't get it exactly right. Would you look with me in your Bible? In verse 47 it says, The king answered unto Daniel and said, Of a truth it is that your God is a... God of gods. You and I don't agree with that. You know what we believe? We believe that he is the God of gods. Right. That he is the Lord of kings. And all I'm saying is that he begins to exalt the God of Daniel, the God of heaven, the God of the Bible. He's exalting him. We see that in Philippians chapter 2, how that Jesus Christ, that he made himself of no reputation. He humbled himself. But God took and exalted him. Thou hast highly exalted him and given him a name above every name. I still love to this day, every time somebody of importance gets in front of a microphone, whether it's winning some championship or whatever it may be, and they put that microphone in front of them and they're waiting for an answer and they say this, well, first of all, I'd like to just thank my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for saving me from my sins. I say amen for that. Amen for that. I appreciate that. That's a blessing to me. And here, here you've got this king, this pagan king, and he's saying, of a truth. He says, I'm certain about this. Just like you're certain about the dream and the interpretation, Daniel, I am certain of this. Of a truth, it is that your God is a God of gods. Boy, can I get an amen on that? My God, your God, our God is a God, capital G, of God's little g. I began to go through and just look it up. You know, I read a moment ago about Jupiter. That's the Roman god, the king of the gods. That's their king of the gods. If you look in the Greek system, they have Zeus. He's the king of the gods. And then if you look in the Canaanite people, they have Baal as their king of the gods. If you go and you look in Norse history, the Nordic people, they have Odin. And out of Odin comes Thor. And I know some of you just got your attention right back on the screen when I said Thor because we've seen enough of the Avengers and all those little bitty G-gods out there, but Thor, son of Odin. I remember one of those things that I tried to discourage my children from watching. They watched it anyway. 
<laughs> and, and, and Thor, or not one of those gods, were out there and they told the Hulk, they said, I'm a god. And he took that guy and he just slammed him on the ground four or five times. And he slammed him on the ground four or five more times. And he just dropped him and he walked off and he said, puny god. Puny god. You know what I say? I say of, of Shiva... I say that Shiva is a puny god, that Ra is a puny god, that Jupiter and Zeus are puny gods. I'm telling you tonight, I've got a god of gods. He's the one true God. He is the ruler of all, has all power given unto him. Amen. That's what this king said. Your God is a God of gods. Don't you know Babylon had other gods there? Nebuchadnezzar's heart's being turned. He's saying, your God's a God of gods. His heart's being turned and he humbles himself. His heart's being turned and he starts exalting God. Then look what else it says about there in verse number 47, and Lord of kings. In other words, that he has power over the kings. And we've already seen that and noted it several times how that Daniel said that he removed kings and setteth up kings, that he has the power to do that. He's the Lord of kings. He can tell the king what to do. You ever heard somebody say this, who died and made you king? You ever had somebody tell you that? <laughs> Who died and made you king? You know what they're saying? <laughs> Why do you get to decide what, what we do? Who, wh who made you king? It's been years ago when we dropped, uh, I think we dropped my son off at, uh, at uh, my wife's family's uh, people. And, and, uh, and uh, I don't think that Brother Cater never really got over this. He reminds me, on a, reminds me of it often. I think we were going to go watch a ball game. I don't remember now what we were going to do, but, but we dropped him off. I don't remember if we dropped Hannah off, and he walked up, and Brother Cater, if you know, if you know Roger Cater, Roger's a big, tall gentleman, big, tall guy. Daniel, a little bit red-headed guy. And, 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 and the way Roger tells it, he said, Daniel, when we left him, he walked up to him, and he said, are you the boss of me? And Roger looked down and said, I guess I am not, son. Yeah, I am. I can tell you what to do. I can tell you what to do. You ever had a child tell you that you're not my mom and dad and you can't tell me what to do? You ever had them do that? I think they need training when they do that. I think somebody needs to teach. This king is saying that God is a Lord. He's over all the kings. He tell them whatever he wants to tell them. Whatever he, whatever he says is what we're going to do. You see his heart being turned? You're talking about the man that has told all the other kings what to do. You understand Nebuchadnezzar is not taking orders from anybody else. Nebuchadnezzar does not have anybody come to him and say, this is what you need to do. He tells the world what they're going to do. And now he says, no, he's the Lord of kings. Look at verse 47. And also a revealer of secrets. Seeing thou couldst reveal this secret, I think it's just, I think that's beautiful. Look at verse number 27. When Daniel finally gets in the presence of Nebuchadnezzar, look what he says. Let me remind you, verse 27. Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king. They can't do it. Verse 28, but there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets. You know what he said? He's taking and he's exalting God as a God of gods, a Lord of kings, and a revealer of secrets, that he has more wisdom than all the wise men and the Chaldeans and the astrologers because Daniel could give him an answer. Oh, that God would help us to be a people, to be able to give other people the answers that they need. You know, there's so many people out there that are hurting and don't know which way to turn. We have a world that's uncertain around us. They don't know what the next step is. They turn to things like drugs and counseling, and they, they turn to things to try to help them be able to deal with the day they're living in. I've read where people are depressed over the election and all those things. Well, I, I may not be excited about the prospect of the, all the elections, but I tell you what, I'm not going to walk around and be depressed because the Bible says the joy of the Lord is your strength. You've got something better than that. And all I'm saying is this. This king is exalting God. Now, listen. Listen to me. If this king can exalt God, don't you think you and I ought to? Come on, let me preach in here just a minute. If a pagan king can exalt God, don't you think we ought to? I don't care if you're 13 or if you're 35. <laughs> you ought to be able to exalt God. I don't care if you've been in church all your life. I, I don't care. I don't, it doesn't matter to me. I don't care. If, 
All I'm saying is this, if you've got a God that has saved you and that has made promises like a mansion and an eternal home and a body one day that'll be incorruptible, listen, we've got a God we ought to praise because of his promises that are true, because of his grace that is good, because of his mercy that is new every morning. Somebody ought to exalt that God instead of people that play football on Sunday. Pagan king can do that. I ought to do that. You see God turning his heart? Now, he hadn't got it all figured out yet, but God's turning that man's heart. And then look at it, verse 48. The Bible says this. Then, then the king made Daniel a great man. Wow. Gave him many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon. Wow. And chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. I'm going to tell you what, what the king did. The king promoted Daniel. Now, that's where we get the heading, the promotion of Daniel. But the king's still the one that's doing that. Do you understand that Daniel is a captive Jew, a slave, that has been brought into the palace? And as far as I can tell, you know, he probably is still at this point in his life living on that pulse and water, and he is not. There's a reputation that's growing about this young man. And I think he's a young man. And he goes in there, this young man, and you've got generals over here. You've got wealthy businessmen over here. You've got people that are a part of the state government over here. And this king falls on his face and worships him. And then after he does that, then he takes and exalts the God of heaven. And then he says this, I'm going to take and I'm going to promote you, Daniel. I'm going to give you the promotion that these other people probably desire. And it says that he made him a great man. In fact, if you just underline this in verse 48, the king made Daniel a great man, and he gave him great gifts, and he gave him great power. He made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon. Do you see that? I'd say that's, a, that's being promoted in an unusual way. That would be like um, the president of the United States calling down here and saying, tell you what I'd like you to do. I saw that missionary tonight um, on the uh, live stream, and I want you to send up Brother Adam Wood to Washington, D.C., I'm going to make him a great man. I've got all kind of great gifts loaded up for him. Got all kind of vehicles. We got boats. We got all kind of things. And, and I tell him, I'm going to make him ruler over all of the federal government, and he'll only be second to me. How many of you youngins think that would be a big deal? That would be a huge deal. I would vote for that. But only God can do that. Nebuchadnezzar takes and promotes Daniel and he makes him a great man. Now here's what I want you to see from that. The Bible says that the, then the king made, and, and don't miss this tonight. Then the king made Daniel a great man. Well, did he? Did the king make Daniel a great man? Did God use a king to make Daniel a great man? There are a lot of people that want, verse 48, to be great, to have great gifts, and to have great power. I'm certain there are people in, in this world that would do all that they could do to be able to have all of those things. But the Bible says in Psalm 75, uh, and we've mentioned it now several times, that promotion comes from God, that God promotes. In fact, look back, if you would, at chapter 1, and I'm, I'm, I know I'm winding down, but just give me a little bit longer. Dan, Daniel chapter 1, if you look there at verse number 9, look what God does. Verse number 9, now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. So why did the prince of the eunuchs love Daniel? Because of his personality, because of his ability, because of his manners. No, no, because God brought Daniel into favor. Look at it again at verse 17. As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill and all learning and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Somebody says, well, Daniel could understand visions and dreams. God gave him that ability. God gave them that knowledge. God is the one that's doing the promoting. And I, I really believe in my, all my heart there are a lot of people that want to be successful. And I don't think it's wrong to have ambition. I don't think it's wrong to, to try to take and improve your life and improve yourself. But I think there's one thing that we need to be careful of. We need to be careful of where we give the glory for that. I, I really don't believe that Daniel believes that 
this king is making him great any more than Joseph believed that Pharaoh was making him great. God is the one exalting Joseph, and God is the one that's exalting Daniel, and I believe it's because Daniel humbled himself. Dan Daniel is somebody that is trying to follow God, and if you just, just indulge me, put a, keep a mark right there in Daniel 2 and go to, Ab uh, go to Genesis chapter 14. Let's look at Abraham just a minute. Genesis chapter 14. Would you turn your Bible? We've only got three or four more points. <laughs> Heard a preacher, not recently, he said, this is my first closing tonight. I don't know if I'm going to say that or not. Genesis chapter 14, if you remember the story, Lot's in, Lot's in trouble. And God, God allows Abraham to go out with these people that are raised in his house, these servants, verse 14. He armed his trained servants born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. He's pursuing after all these other kings in their army, and he wins. And when he comes back, now look in your Bible. When he comes back, the Bible says in verse 18, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him, and he said, Blessed be Abram, the son of the, most high, uh, of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And he blessed the Most High God, which hath delivered the enemies into thine hand, and he gave him tithes of all. And the king of Sodom said unto Abraham, Give me the persons, and take the goods thyself. Tell you what, you give me the people, you keep all the treasure. Look at verse 22. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lift up mine hand unto the Lord, the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from a thread, even to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldest say, I have made Abraham rich. You know what he said? He said, listen, I'm not going to take any of the treasure because I don't want you to say you've made me rich. In fact, I'm just going to raise my hand to heaven and I'm going to praise the Lord for what he's done for me. I'm going to give God the glory. I'm going to follow God. I'm going to keep living for God. Abram left his home, and went out not knowing whether he went. Put great faith in God, and as he goes out, he's walking with God. And now God is going to promote him when he says, I don't want the treasure. You keep it, king. You're not going to be the one that says that you made me great, and that you made me a great man, and you made me full of riches. I'm saying that God's going to do that, and if he's the one that does it, I'm going to give him the credit and glory for it. Let me tell you something. Are you listening to me tonight? I believe with all my heart. Listen to me. Are you listening? If you want to be promoted, the best way to be promoted is to live your life for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Don't live for yourself. Live your life to please the Lord. Live your life giving glory to God for whatever you have in this world. And don't say, okay, well, this business, the business may be good to you. The company may be good to you. You may have friends that are good to you. But I'm telling you right now, you ought to recognize that every good gift comes down from God. God, thank you. I'm going to give him the praise for it. And if I make it in life, that's fine. If I don't, that's fine. So that's exactly what I believe Daniel's doing. He's going to give God the credit for it. But go now, if you would, to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew 4. I think there are other people that will try to help promote you in life. Here it looks like the king of Sodom was going to take a little credit for Abraham being who he was. And he would be a wealthy man. He would have all kind of treasure, all kind of cattle, but he got it from God. He said, God did it for me. And then the Bible says, look in Matthew chapter 4 in your Bible, Jesus is being tempted of the devil. And look what the Bible says. Verse number 8, again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kings of this world and the glory of them and saith unto him, all these things will I give thee if thou will fall down and worship me. You know what Satan said? I'll promote you. All these kingdoms I'll give to you. You don't have to go to that cross. I'll go ahead and I'll give you the crown now. There's no need to suffer. I'll go ahead and I'll give you the crown right now. All you got to do is just fall down and worship me. And what Satan is doing, he is, he is enticing, he's tempting the Lord to promotion. And I'm saying there, there are some things out there that you don't need the devil's help in and you don't need him aiding you. I, I, I still, in my mind, I, I don't know that I'll ever forget it. A, a dear man in our church that had a business that he was part of and he got on fire and he got in the church and he brought his family. And man, they, just like this family in front of me tonight, they started growing in the Lord, bringing their Bible. I mean, they were just, their family's thriving. And he came to a place 
And that place he came to, they offered him a job that would take him out of church one day a month, one Sunday a month. And he came to me and said, Preacher, listen, I'm thinking about this job. It's, it's a good-looking job. It's, I, I finally get away from the place that I'm working. There's a lot less pressure. I'll go down there. But he said, bad thing is i got to miss once a month. I said, don't take it. Don't take it. He said, Pastor, I, the job I'm in right now, the pressure is horrible. It, it's, it's an open door. I said, I don't believe it's an open door because it's going to take you away from the church and it's not going to be good for your family. You know, he took the job. He's still a friend today. He took the job and once a month that he said he was going to be out turned into once a month that he was there. It just kept moving a little bit farther and farther and farther away. You know, I think there are things the devil will offer you if you'll just go ahead and work on his terms. He'll say, I'll tell you what, I can make something out of you. I've heard of many of a rock musician that said they signed a contract with the devil to make them great. Yeah, I, I don't want that kind of promotion. I, I don't want the devil's promotion. I don't want the devil's snares in my life. I want to follow God, and if he wants to promote me, amen, and if he doesn't, I'll be happy where I am, but I certainly don't want the devil taking and directing anything in my life. And then, then thirdly, turn to one other place and then we'll be finished with that. Go, if you would, to Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Most of us probably would say, well, preacher, I, I, don't, I don't really have dealings with the devil. I'd say amen for that. And I'm satisfied with the, the life God's given me. If God wants me to live this life, then I'm satisfied. We'll go to Ecclesiastes chapter 2 because Daniel's been promoted. Daniel's been promoted. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 God can promote, which the Bible teaches. The devil can offer promotion, but you can promote yourself. And if you look at it, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 2 of Solomon, a wise man, the Bible says in verse number 4, I made me great works. Look how busy. I builded me houses. I planted me vineyards. I made me gardens and orchards. I planted trees in them of all kinds. I made me pools of water. Verse 7, I got me servants and maidens and had servants born in my house. Also I had great possessions of great and small cattle above me that were in Jerusalem before me. I gathered me also silver and gold and the peculiar treasure of kings and of provinces. I got me men singers and women singers and the delights of the sons of men and musical instruments and that of all sorts. So I was, can you say the word for me? Let's try it one more time. Verse number nine, so I was what? I was great. That's exactly what the Bible says that Daniel was made by Nebuchadnezzar, that he made him a great man. Well, sometimes promotion may come from the devil when it contradicts God's principles, and God can exalt you if you'll follow him, but there are some people, they are so given to being great and to having all that, that life has to offer that they work hard and they, they spend their days and they, they spend their time being busy. And I thought, I, I think we ought to be busy, but I'm going to tell you something. Being busy and losing your family is a bad choice. Amen. Being busy and losing your testimony is a bad choice. Taking and building something for yourself and, and building on a life that you can have. And you know, the, the truth is, the, the Bible's so clear that our life is just a vapor. It's here for a little while and then vanisheth away. And all those things that you gather to yourself, you know what? Somebody else gets to enjoy them. Are you listening? I had an uncle. He had this wicker furniture. I remember he took me upstairs one day and he wanted to show me this wicker furniture. And those of you that have wicker furniture, I'm not against wicker furniture. It's just never been anything really interesting to me. And he, he told me what kind of wicker it was and when it was made. Then he showed me how he had it painted and all the money that it spent, he'd spent to get it redone. And, all, I mean, and he wanted me to admire this wicker furniture, which I was having a real problem doing. And then he said this to me. He said, and I told my boys, you can never sell this furniture. This stays in the family. Well, you know what they did with it? They did what I'd do with it. If somebody offered me $1,000 for wicker furniture, I'd sell it too. Amen. <laughs> in fact, I'd take, I'd take $500 for either dog that we have. No, let's jump to $200. I'd take $200 for either one of the dogs we have. You can call me up after service, but... Um, in his mind, this was something that, that gave him status and achievement. And what I'm saying is that you and I need to be careful 
of that. Now, now, before I close, go back to Daniel 2, and I want you to look at this for just a minute. Huh. What would that do to you? Come on. Just, let's just be, let, let's, let's think just a minute through what we're looking at. What would it do to you for somebody to lay out prostrate in front of you that was of such immense status and worship you and then tell everybody in the room, you go get some oblations and sweet odors for this man. And then him to look at you and say, I'm going to make you a great man and I'm going to bring you great gifts and they start bringing stuff in. He said, I'm going to make you ruler over all the province of Babylon. You get to have the the office at the highest penthouse that we have, the largest room, you're going to be there. Boy, you'd think that, man, Daniel would just kind of get puffed up with that. But to his credit, look at verse 49. Then Daniel requested of the king, and he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. You know what he did? He said, hey, can, can, you, give my, can you give my friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, can you give them a place to serve? Those are men that prayed for him. Those are, those are people that were his friends. And, he, and then the Bible says in verse 49, and Daniel sat in the gate of the king. Now, he's still close, but he's sitting in the gate. Now, that is where people come through. That's definitely a place of business in this world. But what I'm saying is Dan, Daniel appears not to allow it to go to his head. And that's exactly what John the Baptist did. You know, I, I think of all the men in the Bible that had an opportunity to, to really have a, a big head about themselves. Think about this. John the Baptist was the forerunner of Jesus Christ. John the Baptist was full, or he, he was full of the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. That's impressive. The Bible says that he was great in the sight of the Lord before he was ever born. God looked down at John the Baptist. He said he's great. The Bible said among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. So John the Baptist has the opportunity to really feel good about himself. But instead of allowing that promotion to lift his heart up, you know what he says in John chapter 3 and verse 30? He must increase, but I must decrease. In John chapter 1 verse 27, he said, I'm not worthy to bend down and loose his shoe latchet. That I am not worthy to touch his shoe latchet. That he is the one that ought to be magnified and glorified. Boy, I'm telling you, listen. If God's exalted you, you ought to give God the glory. If God's promoted you, you ought to give him the glory. You ought to appreciate and you ought to understand it may not have anything to do with you. It may just have to do with God's plan. And say, Lord, thank you. And don't be like Nebuchadnezzar because I really believe that Nebuchadnezzar, look back there at chapter 2, verse 38. And whithersoever the children of men dwell, the beast of the field and the fowls of heaven hath he given into thine hand and hath made thee ruler over them all. You see what it says in your Bible? <laughs> Thou art this head of gold. Huge image. There's a head of gold at the top, and that's the top kingdom, and then it just descends down. And we get into the Persian kingdom, and then the Grecian kingdom, and then the Roman Empire, and we just kind of gold, and then silver, and then brass, and then clay and iron. But up at the top is fine gold, fine gold. And, and, and Daniel says, thou art this head of gold. You're this head of gold. Have you ever told, have anybody ever told you you're really smart? Has anybody ever told you you're really good looking? <laughs> you girls need to be real careful. A guy starts talking about how pretty your eyes are, and I've never seen anybody with eyes like your eyes, and... You know, say, well, what, have you seen three-eyed three three -eyed people? Is that what you've been looking at? Because I have two like everybody else. Oh, I've never seen anybody with such beautiful hair as you have. Oh, my, i got three girls. So I have, I have pretty chill, pretty girls, pretty girls. But I don't need anybody else telling them that. And what I'm saying is this. They went their head. You're, and, you know, young guys, boy, you're, you hear anybody tell you how strong you are? Josh, you ever hear anybody say, boy, you're a strong-looking young man. you got some muscles. You ever hear anybody do that? Have you? Robbie has. <laughs> All the time. Somebody said, oh, I, 
other day, somebody grabbed my arm. I hadn't worked out. Oh, I'm, I, I do good to get on a treadmill and walk for 30 minutes, let alone work out. And somebody grabbed my arm and they said, oh, and I thought, lie, but that's a lie. That is not true. It's the other way. <laughs> it, it ain't what it used to be. And this, but this king, this king, look at it. Look at it again there, verse number 38. Thou art this head of gold. You know what that means? His kingdom was at the top. He had the kingdom that was at the head, and he was this head of fine gold. And you know what happens to him? Chapter 3, verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits. He just had to have a whole lot more of himself, and everybody was going to have to worship it. Now, God's working on this man's heart. He's turning his heart. He's turned it to the place where he's humbled himself before God. He's turned it to the place that he's exalted the God of heaven. And he's promoted one of God's choice servants. But he's not finished working on him yet. He's working on turning that heart. That the king's heart is in the Lord's hand and he turneth it whithersoever he will. So here's what I'm going to say tonight. Listen. God has the ability... God has the ability to turn the heart of the people that you love. And I would encourage you just to keep knocking. Lord, please, I'd encourage you to continue being good to them. Continue speaking the word of God to them when occasion came up. Lord, please, because God can take that heart and he can turn it the right direction. Boy, Nebuchadnezzar's going to be a help down the road. But God's going to turn that heart of the king. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. Robbie, I want you to come to the pen. We're going to be dismissed with a song. And, and here's what I'd like to pray tonight. I, I know we've gone a little bit longer than normal, but that's okay. Um, we had a lot of good singing tonight. Is there somebody right now that you could think of that needs their heart turned? And maybe you've given up hope on that. Maybe it's salvation. Maybe it's doing right. Maybe they're in your family. Maybe they're in your church. Maybe they live in your neighborhood. Maybe they work across from you at the place of business that you have. And it's just kind of gotten hard to continue trying to reach out to them and try to believe that God could do something in their life. Here's what I'd like to end tonight. I'd just like to end with us praying. Would you think about that person God's put in your heart tonight? And would you ask them, God, if you could turn the heart of a king of a nation, would you please turn their heart? Would you do what it takes? Would you send what they need to have their heart tendered or perhaps burdened or troubled? to where they'd respond to those things that they've already heard with their ears or maybe seen with their eyes or have experienced in their heart. God, would you do something to turn their heart? Would you do that tonight? Lord, would you please help us? I, I marvel that you could take and turn the heart of the king of the known world. And God, you could take a man and have him prostrate on the floor. <laughs> Have him exalting a God that he didn't even know. Promoting a man that, that had a heart for that God above all the other people in the room. And I know, Lord, that you, you had something that you were uniquely doing in Nebuchadnezzar's life. And I'm, I'm asking you, Lord, for our good people, for our people that have loved ones and friends, God, would you help them believe that it still makes a difference to hold that name up before you, to call that name out in prayer, to keep knocking like that widow that went to that judge's house, Lord, and just not to give up on that. And if you can turn Nebuchadnezzar's heart, oh, you could turn their heart. Would you please do it? Would you please do it for the glory of Jesus Christ's sake? Amen. Robbie.